Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. I'm back with you again, uh, continuing on in Romans, Romans part 33. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, the only access that we have. We're just grateful, Lord, for the opportunity that you've given us to just look upon your word, to feast upon it. I just ask that you would strip away all that which is error, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you've been studying along with us in the uh, Epistle to the Romans, um, you know that we are uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of verse uh, 18, 19, 20. Of chapter 5 we had reached verse 19 of chapter 5 basically this is where we've come to uh, in the wonderful study of this chapter and we're getting ready to go into an even marvelous more a one more wonderful in my opinion chapter that's chapter 6 the Holy Spirit has enlisted Paul to deal with the subject of man's total depravity if you followed through us with us you've seen this and the, the marvelous abounding grace in God's provision through Christ. And as we uh, study this last section of chapter 5, I can't help but think what a, a wonderful revelation that it is. After we dealt with man's total depravity, we're now told that there was something wonderful done in Jesus Christ. It's the two opposite extremes. For all sin and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace. And as I've mentioned before, it's astounding how many Christians quote the first portion of that verse. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and they fall short of continuing on with the sins having been justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So that's a, a wonderful truth that we've been developing. In the fifth chapter, uh, well, the fourth chapter ended with the fact that Christ was delivered by means of our offenses and raised by means of our justification. All that is required for our righteousness was satisfied in Jesus Christ. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. My righteous servant shall justify the many. We came then to the close, the, the closing paragraph, at least, of, of chapter 5. For by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. There was a universal aspect as a result of Adam's transgression. And so death entered the world through the disobedience of one man. And in that disobedience, as the federal head of the human race, all sinned. And so death entered the world system. However, one might conclude that death is only the result of breaking the law and i pointed out in my last video uh, there's a tremendous effort particularly on the part of of the world religious system the human merit-based system on the part of modern christianity to make the law universal the text clearly tells us there was no law from adam to moses no law this is what the text clearly says. You, you can read the writings of many a theologian who stumbles over his own feet trying to prove that there was always law and that 
people up until Moses broke laws. The text clearly says there was no law. There wasn't any law. There was sin there. Therefore, we, we see we don't need law for sin, even though some theologians would say uh, it is intuitively obvious that without law, there is no sin. Absolutely not. Without law, there is no transgression. But sin has nothing to do with law. Law makes it strong. The strength of sin is the law. Law makes it abound, as we will see shortly. But law is not the basis of sin. It wasn't any law. In fact, I believe that to be crucially important because for if we once recognize that there was no law from Adam to Moses, we can begin to recognize the temporary aspect of the law. The law was added until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. If the law was added, it can be subtracted. You're not under law, you're under grace. The law was an additional thing. The promise was given to Abraham, the father of, of all who believe, and the law which came 430 years later cannot disannul that promise, and so without law, there was still death, because death is the result of sin, not the result of law. And so we have an aspect of that transgression in Adam that has brought death upon all. And so our text says we now have the provision that God has made in Christ that death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who hadn't, who hadn't sinned like Adam did. How did Adam sin? He broke a law. Transgression is breaking a law. God says there was no law. Verse 13. If you'll take a look at verse 13. From God's standpoint, from Adam to Moses, there was no law. Now, now, we can argue philosophically there was a universal moral code. I've talked about this early on in, in past videos, maybe even mentioned this in the, in the videos in Ephesians, and the universal moral code is a problem, particularly to the atheist. Folks, I'm looking at the text. There was no law from Adam to Moses. No law from Adam to Moses. I do not think that anyone, anybody, biblically, can tell me that Abraham broke any law, but Abraham sinned. Now, undoubtedly, there is a universal moral code. I don't argue against the universal moral code. Is that the law of God? I don't know. I, I believe my text says, that God is pointing out here logically that sin doesn't require law. I think that's what we're being shown. As I've mentioned, I, th I think it was sin when people used to speed through my town here before there was a legal speed limit law. I'm, I am 100% in, in favor of law. I mean, I think Congress ought to pass any law they want to if they'd repeal six existing laws for every new one they passed. It's, it's the people of my county who felt that it was wrong to endanger children at play in order to post a speed limit law through my community. And 
it was a sin to speed before there was ever a law. And they made it a transgression by passing a law. They made it a transgression by passing a law. It looks to me like that's what God is doing. He's going to have the law enter that the offense might abound. It was sin. But to make it abound, to show that it's sin, he's going to pass law. So there wasn't any law to Moses anyway, and death reigned. Now, now we have to do something with that death. First of all, first of all, it affected God's elect. For if through, verse 15, if through the offense of the one, the many, I believe that is God's elect, be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by the one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto the many. So, there is an abounding of the gift of Jesus Christ, particularly to the elect. It isn't by the one that sinned, so is the gift. The judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift, verse 16, the free gift is of many offenses to justification of life many offenses and in fact the word offenses there ends in mu alpha so it isn't it isn't the action it's the result of the action for if by one man's offense the death reigned by the one much more they which receive abundance of the grace of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by the one Jesus Christ. In order for that to happen, as by the offense of the one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. In order for verse 17, folks, to happen, verse 18 has to be there. The condemnation that passed upon all men was removed in Jesus Christ. This is why children go to heaven. No child will wind up in hell. Upon all men came justification of life. And I spent some time on that in my last video. I believe that. Clearly, the text is telling us that there was a super abounding result of the work of Jesus Christ to God's elect. And that's kind of what I want to focus on in this video. But to initiate that work, the condemnation that resulted from Adam's sin was removed for all men. There was a spiritual death, which means there had to be a spiritual life that preceded it. I spent a little time on that. If you uh, have been following us along here, at least I spent a few minutes anyway pointing out that you can't speak of anything being dead if it weren't alive first, if it wasn't first alive. It doesn't start out dead, okay? It, it starts out alive, and then that thing's dead. The very fact that you would say it, it's dead, you infer that, that at one time it was alive. That's not complicated. So those who were alive in Adam died in Adam. Now, the justification of life came upon them 
And one can say with, with absolute confidence that nobody is going to go to hell because Adam sinned. Nobody. Not even Adam. Nobody goes to hell because Adam sinned. At the great white throne judgment, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's the judgment for the non-elect, non the non-believers. Unredeemed mankind will not be able to suggest, stand there before God and suggest that God is sending them to hell because Adam sinned. It's not going to happen. It will not be about what they could have done to remedy the effects of the fall by something that, that, that they did, okay? It will be about what they did with the person in the work of Jesus Christ who himself took upon himself, took upon their sin. And now we finally get to verse 19. Romans 5. Verse 19. I spent a lot of time looking at this. I, I at least try to make an effort to review what has gone before us in the text as we enter into the verse that, where we continue on. I spent a lot of time with this. I didn't want to rush to put this out, out there. For as by one, for, for as by means of the one man's disobedience, the many were constituted or stand down as sinners. Stand down. That's what the word means. They are sinners. They sin. If you say you have no sin, you make him a liar, and the truth is not in you. That's First John chapter 1. Uh, a passage that almost every Christian is aware of. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. First John chapter 3. There's a lot of Christians who aren't so familiar with that. The words were made in the authorized version in your, in your Bible, were made, is a, is a compound word in the Greek. Kathistomy, uh, down, and it's from two, two words, down, histomy, and to stand, which means to set down in place, that is put in charge, to give standing authority, which enables someone to rule or exercise decisive force that's what it means for as by means of the one man's disobedience the many were constituted or stand down as sinners and and it's an aorist tense in the same way by the obedience of the one shall the many stand down as righteous this is what our text is saying. Grammatically here, it is, it, is, it is almost impossible to argue against it. Uh, uh, that, that these are God's elect. It, it isn't everyone in Adam and a few in Christ. The subject of verse 19 is God's elect. They stand down as sinners because of Adam's disobedience. And they stand down as righteous because of Christ's obedience. Christ reversed the effects of Adam's fall. Now, the question that arises in, in so many minds is why the first one's an aorist tense and the second one is a future. Well, First of all, it's a passive. Let me tell you, based upon this verse, and, and, and that's, that is the grandeur of the Word of God. In fact, it's going to be the superabounding subject of the next verse. Which, folks, I'll be honest, I feel very incompetent to handle. No matter how much you fail, because you can't exhaust God's grace, you can't spend it up, you stand down as righteous. 
And the only people that that offends, what I just said offends, the only ones that it, it offends are those who believe that we become righteous by what we do or don't do. That's, that's the only ones who take offense at that. And who fail to understand that we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ and cannot, we cannot become any more righteous by what we do or do not do. How righteous is the righteousness of God? Therefore, as a result of our knowing where we stand in God's grace, it really does matter to us how we live. It's also a true statement for me to say that if we're fully righteous and we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, it really doesn't matter how we live. But to us, it does. Don't, don't get confused here. Uh, Ephesians 1 and 5, chapters 1 and 5, and Colossians chapter 1, tell us, show us, teach us, without question, without question, that God sees us as holy, spotless, without blame. We stand before him in love, made the righteousness of God in Christ. We therefore live as who and what we are, not what we might hope to somehow, someday be. This is what God meant in the words, grace did much more abound. One verse most are, are familiar with is 1 John 1.7. 1 John 1.7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Look at the verse, folks. What does that verse say? It says, if you're walking in the light as he is in the light, you're still sinning. You're still sinning. Come on, that's what the verse says. That's what it says. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ shall cleanse you from all sin. That means walking in the light, you are still sinning. Walking in the light, you are still sinning. That's what it, it, the text is saying. Why? Because you were constituted a sinner in Adam. And that hasn't changed. And as you walk as a sinner, which God doesn't see, you stand down as righteous. You're still sinning. You're still sinning because God doesn't look upon. God doesn't look upon the old man, but he looks upon the new creation in Christ Jesus, who has been made righteous and cannot sin. Cannot. The new man cannot sin. We're dual-natured creatures, folks. Who, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot, he doesn't have the power to sin, because he is born of God, 1 John 3, 9. Yet the old man, that's all the old man does is sin. Now, no, nobody out there listening to me, nobody, nobody, including me, looks all that righteous in our own eyes and and in the eyes of one another. You don't always see yourself as righteous because you stand down as sinners in Adam. You have an old man that does nothing but sin. But that's not who you are. That's that's as a new creation in Christ Jesus, you are constantly shown righteous. This is why the text says, who shall lay the, char the charge against God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Surely the one laying the charge is Satan. And how do you look? 
you stand down as righteous because of the obedience of Jesus Christ. His obedience. You see the terror in the minds of modern Christians. In fact, of Christians down through the years is the inference in verse 19 that, it, well, it just doesn't matter how you live. doesn't matter. Well, Steve, I don't know how many times I've heard it. Steve, you're under grace. You say you were under grace, so you can just live however you want. You stand down righteous. No. No, says the human mind. That that just that can't be. That can't be. So we write books like like Easy Believism or Lordship Salvation. You know, anything that tries to make it reasonable to the human mind that if you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, then by gosh, you've got to live it. I mean, you got to act like it. If you're a Christian, you better act like one. You are righteous because you live righteous. You are righteous because you, you try to be righteous, you know, because you pray, because you work for holiness. That's what makes you righteous, Steve. Don't give me all this grace crap. And grace goes out the window. I've often wondered in my mind what it must have been like. What must it have been like for David to be king of Israel after he murdered a man and took his wife? I can imagine what people must have said behind his back. There isn't an organization I, I know, particularly a Christian organization, that I know of, which would have allowed David to continue as king. But God did. He would have been excommunicated or whatever term you want to use, but he wouldn't have been king. He wouldn't have been president. But God's grace sees David as righteous. The problem is that when we look at the grace of God, it appears as though we're saying, well, you, you can have a casual attitude towards sin. I believe, folks, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you love him, first of all, because he loved you. And you'd like to please him. Just as any man who, who really loves his wife or any wife who really loves her husband, wants to please him you know or her but the pleasing is not the point the supreme subject of our present text the subject of our present text is the obedience of christ not your obedience you do not stand down as righteous by anything you do if you happen to do anything that is righteousness, it's because you are righteous. First John 3, he that doeth righteousness is righteous. His doing righteousness did not make him righteous. His doing righteousness showed him to be righteous. But you see, that has to be in God's eyes. It has to be in God's eyes, not ours. It's by the disobedience of Adam that you were constituted or stand down as a sinner. And that you are. In fact, in fact, the next two chapters are going to deal intimately with this very subject. I see then that with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Don't get the idea, folks, in the 19th verse of the fifth chapter of Romans, that by the 
obedience of Jesus Christ, you cease to be a sinner. If we say, say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But rejoice in the glory and the grace of God that doesn't, of God that doesn't see you as a sinner. God does not see you as a sinner. You know, for years when I was asked to speak, I always said, introduce me as a sinner saved by grace. I mean, that always sounded good to me. And, and I got that. I think I got that out of a hymn. I didn't get that out of this book. And I suddenly realized God never calls me a sinner saved by grace. He didn't call me that. He calls me righteous. He calls me a saint. He calls you righteous. He calls you a saint. When there is unrighteousness of which you can accuse me, Jesus Christ is there saying, I am righteous. Righteous because I bore his iniquity by my obedience. Speaking of David, there is or, or there used to be uh, a tract put out by the Atheist uh, Society of America that, that goes through a bunch of Old Testament characters that said, do you really want to worship a God who has people like this? And when I read that tract, I said, I said, praise God, that is exactly the kind of God that I want to worship. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Jesus Christ, my Lord. I was constituted a sinner. And folks, it's an aorist, so it's timeless. Timeless. There is therefore now no judgment for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. How can it be that you won't stand in judgment for your sin? In every situation, every situation, God sees you through Jesus Christ. I don't issue too many challenges uh, from my viewers, I, but I'll, I'll, I'll issue this one. I challenge anyone to find one verse, just one verse in the New Testament where God is speaking of an Old Testament saint where he even indicates that he knows they sinned. Sodom and Gomorrah vexed Lot's righteous soul. Now, wait a minute. God, I find it hard to call Lot righteous. Well, God considered it easy to call him righteous. Or maybe I shouldn't say that. No, not easy. Through the finished work of Jesus Christ, Lot stood righteous before God. Abraham stands righteous before God. Paul stands righteous before God. Oh, but not me, Steve. Oh, yes, you. You stand righteous before God. We'll see in the seventh chapter that I was alive apart from the law once. Paul is saying that he was alive apart from the law when the commandment came, sin revived, and he died. Now he died in Adam. How did he get alive? Separate from the law. Well, he did that. In verse 18 of our fifth chapter, he died in Adam. He died in Adam. He was made alive for the justification of life came upon all men. And then the law came, sin revived, and he died. Now he needs to be born again. Now he needs to be born from above. He needs the application of the obedience of Jesus Christ. 
that I firmly believe. I, I firmly believe that's why it's a future. It's not only that, it's a future because it's always applied to you. We walk in the light as he is in the light. The blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us from all sin. The text, folks, clearly indicates that walking in the light as he is in the light does not mean that you see sinning. It does mean that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. You are constantly future tense. It's a future tense, which is a durative action in the grammar, a continuing action. The aorist is a punctiliar action. Punctiliar is occurring at a definite and particular point in time. Standing down as righteous. It's marvelous. And that's the grace of God. Now, I, I don't know what to do with the next verse because the, well, just because the grace of God is such an overwhelming subject. You know, there are Grace Bible Churches, Grace Baptist Churches, Grace, you know, this church, Grace that church, and Grace this and Grace that. And so little understanding of the grace of God. Folks, I tell you, based upon God's word, that, that you standing down as righteous has nothing to do with the way you live. And when I say that, I recognize keenly, I mean, I keenly recognize that I am, I am directly against the Keswick movement, the Lordship, Salvation movement, no telling how many other religious organizations and movements, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the results of the finished work of Jesus Christ will be in your particular life. Don't have, don't have any ability to know that. I never ever would have thought it, it was David's premeditated murder and adultery. I don't know what God is doing with you. I know that God is working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That I do know. And I also know that it would probably be in everybody's best interest to wait until he gets done, you know, with, with some individual before I decide to make any judgments like that, to have any criticism of them. I don't know where God is in your life. What I do know is that your righteousness is not based upon your performance. That's, that's what I do know. Folks, we don't change ourselves, nor do we change God's word, nor do we change one another. God's word changes us. God's word, this book, this book will change us. I recognize that the word, get this to me, were made, and it's only used twice in the book of Romans, and both of them in this verse. And, and you, you, I mean, you can, of course, you can study the word all you want. It is used to place one in authority. That's what, that's what the word, that's how the word is used. If we took that meaning, and that's what, that's really what the Catholic movement did, and, and they used this verse. that you are placed in authority you are placed in authority over your your righteousness it's up to you it's up to you what christ did dying on the cross is is basically what he did was he, he was it, it 
he, he gave you the opportunity to take charge of your righteousness and and I have heard whole sermons on that. In fact, I have several written articles on that from the, the Lordship Salvation Group. I'm not saying it. Well, I don't know how to put this. None of it goes back to the first part of the verse. None of them say that you're put in charge of your sin. Now, now maybe, maybe they would say to me, if they were here, well, that's so obvious. I mean, we don't have to mention it. You know, you can sin if you want to and, and not sin if you don't want, want to. I don't know how Christianity became so single-natured in its theology when we were to have two natures. It's the very foundation of Christianity itself. That, that somehow, you know, they think that we've got to clean up the old man because we're just this, you know, I, you know, yeah, we were saved, we accepted Christ, but nothing really happened. We're just this old man and we got to clean up our flesh. That's forget, never mind, you know, you know, forget the, the, the fact that we were made a new creation in Christ, that we were given a sinless new nature, a nature that cannot sin. Why do you think, folks, that Christ, when he came into our lives, why do you think we were made a new creation? Because we, he, there had to be a sinless new man, new creation. We had to be made a new creation and given a sinless new man in which he could reside because he cannot be touched by sin. Did you know that you live, your relationship with Christ is one in which you, he, God resides, Christ resides in you. A, a very specific part of you. He resides in that new man that is sinless that he created. It has nothing to do with the flesh, the old man, the sin nature that we inherited in, in Adam that God could have removed if he had wanted to, but didn't. And for very good reason. As much as it annoys us, torments us, in fact. God left us with that old nature, but he's not trying to clean up the old man. The marvelous beauty of grace is that we have Christ living. Actually, it's the very fullness of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit living within a new, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the new wine being put in, not in old wine skins, but a new creation. We are dual-natured creatures. Folks, go out go out your front door, look at the first non-believer you see, and, and what you're looking at is you're looking at a single-natured individual. He's only got one. You have two. You and I have two. They're in Adam, we're in Christ. We have an old man that continues to sin. If we say we have no sin, the truth, we lie against the truth. But God has nothing to do with the old man. Nothing. The flesh profits nothing. From the flesh comes, in the flesh dwells no good thing. You know, I, I can, uh, I, I can never remember a time when I ever wanted to sin. So if I don't sin when I, when, when I don't want to, then I'm sinlessly perfect. Now, now, that's just a real thrill. Now, maybe most of you people out there sin because you want to. I haven't seen that in my walk with the Lord. Sin, folks, devastates me. I don't want to sin. If I'm in charge, if I'm in charge, if I'm reigning, if I'm in charge of whether or not I sin, I'm doing a rotten job. And you could argue, well, you're probably doing a rotten job with your righteousness, you know, as well. And that's all true. 
and, and somehow or other, you and I have very skillfully removed the text, removed the text from the disobedience of Adam and the obedience of Christ. And we've moved it over to my disobedience, my obedience. Isn't that something? Isn't that, isn't that insidious? We've concentrated on being in charge of our sin and being in charge of our righteousness, which is insidiously snuck in there, destroying the disobedience of Adam and the obedience of Christ. And it's made the text say that it's based upon my disobedience and my obedience. And folks, I don't care how many views this channel gets, I will not do that. The text says it is Adam's disobedience and Christ's obedience, not mine. And I'm telling you that that movement and, and that treatment of verse 19 has removed the concept of grace. And, you know, and I don't have any of those articles that go into the 20th verse where sin abounded, grace superabounded. You know, the word is uh, huper perisuo, huper perisuo, superabounded. The disobedience is Adam's, the obedience is Christ. The only responsibility, the only responsibility that I can pass on to you is to believe it. What a wonderful, wonderful grace. And what a wonderful, wonderful Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for just, you know, the little time that we've had to think upon your word, to dwell upon it, to feast upon it. Just ask that you would enlighten our, our minds and our hearts to the truth of your word. Seal out that which is there, for it's in Christ's name I, I pray. Amen. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.